Mic check one, check two, check, check.
Do you feel that way? Like oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> Our mics are on. Huh? Our mics weren't on mute. <laughs> That's funny. All right. Oh, it's getting quiet. So I guess I know. we should stop. I guess so. Well, we, I just said it just got quiet, so that must mean it's time for us to start. Okay. Uh, well, uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. It's so glad, uh, we're so glad to see you here. Hope that you have and are continuing to enjoy and be uh, inspired by the Diversity Symposium. Um, we are here uh, as a fireside chat, and um, my role, I'm Blanche Hughes. I serve as the Vice President for Student Affairs. And I'm going to serve as the moderator for the chat. And depending on how the conversation goes, I might be inspired to jump in uh, uh, to you know, add a perspective or two in the conversation. Uh, but um, it's important for us to be able to have this conversation. And we'll talk more about uh, the role that student affairs plays in, uh, in diversity as well, because we also have a major role in and particularly supporting students and, and supporting the Office of Diversity in these efforts. We'll talk more about that later, but that's enough from <coughs> me. The other th role I will also play is I'm the timekeeper, and I'm also, uh, we will try to uh, have at least 30 minutes or so of questions. We know that many of you submitted questions ahead of time. Many of those questions we know will probably be addressed in the conversation that we're going to have here. And then we'll have some time for us to ask a few of the questions that were submitted uh, for the last 30 minutes or so. And so I'll be also the one that's uh, coordinating that piece. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Mary and okay. uh, we'll get started. Great. How many of you attended the fall address? Oh, oh, a great. lot. So if you were at the fall address, you heard uh, our president, Joyce McConnell, speak pretty passionately about events that had occurred on our campus. And so my uh, request of her right now is to talk about how she has developed her philosophy regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, and, and how that has, has framed responses to some of those events that occurred on campus. Well, thank you, Mary. And first of all, to the audience, I want to thank you for being here. And I also want to thank Blanche and Mary, because um, I couldn't be surrounded by two better people to have this conversation. I want to start by talking about the promise of a land-grant university and the idea of access. And part of my passion about what I talked about at the fall address, about fighting racism and bias, is actually linked to the fact that access is only one step. If we can't create an environment in which our students, all our students, can thrive and feel that they're being supported and not have to encounter daily um, uh, microaggressions and the kinds of insults that we heard students talking about, um, then those students are not going to do or will have a much harder time doing as well because they're fighting two fights, the fight for getting an education and the fight for feeling like they belong at a place like CSU. My passion about race and bias, um, and I'm gonna use those terms rather than simply talking in terms of diversity and inclusion, because we've, we, and Mary will talk about this some more, we've really focused over the last bunch of years on diversity and inclusion and what it means to diversify our faculty, our employees, and our student body and do whatever we can to help people feel and to actually be included. But if we actually know that we have incidents of race and bias on campus and that we reflect what's happening nationally, I feel like it's incumbent on us to then be targeting those particular things and working very hard to eliminate them. So those, that, that is what drove my fall address and the announcement of the Race Bias Equity Initiative. And for those of you who weren't at the fall address, that uh, the Race Bias Equity Initiative was, is very similar to one 
that was started uh, two, three years ago at the University of Washington, which they feel they've had some significant success with. And Mary and Blanche and their teams actually had a conversation with the people at the University of Washington and were really optimistic about what they did, what we can learn from them, and how that can help us really make change that matters. ask you a question about the definition of diversity. When we were developing our definition of diversity here at Colorado State University, we were focused on a couple of concepts. One was inclusive excellence, the notion that we cannot be excellent as an institution unless we were inclusive, mm -hmm. right? And also the idea that we were trying to create a campus where everybody would feel not just that they are welcome on campus, but they are valued and that they are affirmed. Um, you know, back in the day, people were welcome to a campus, but they were not necessarily uh, valued on the campus. You know, during the, you know, when people were tokenized, they were not valued on campus and their, their contributions were certainly not affirmed. And so we wanted to take it to a different level so that they were welcome, valued, and affirmed. And you see that a lot in the information that we, that we have. Um, and so we de decided that we would have a broad definition of diversity, but always pay attention to the fact that there were some individuals who were historically excluded from higher education. <clears throat> so our definition is really pretty broad, and it includes uh, such dimensions as age and race, um, sexual orientation, ability status, documentation status, uh, to name a few. First generation status is in there, familial status, a whole variety of, of different dimensions. Um, when you think about diversity, are you, you thinking about it broadly or because other institutions think of it much more uh, narrowly. And so what are your thoughts about that? Well, I think the definition that you've adopted as a broad definition is very important. Um, I think it's very important to include all of those categories where people are experiencing marginalization for one reason or another. But I do think that there's um, a way in which we need to be paying particular attention, as you said, to people who have often been kept off our campuses or have not felt welcome on our campuses. And so, um, and that, that is something that can change given any given place, but I think this broad definition of diversity for this place at this time in the nation is something that's very critical. So Mary, uh, you know that I'm relatively new to CSU and every day is a wonderful day of discovery. Um, <laughs> and, and Mary and Blanche have been such amazing uh, sources of information for me. But I really, I know you've worked very hard, both of you, um, around diversity and inclusion issues for a very long time. And can you share some of that with us, with the audience, so that we all know all of the efforts that have taken place up to now. Okay. Sure, I would be happy to do that. <laughs> Actually, when I saw that, I thought, hallelujah, we can, you know, we can talk about some of the things that we have been doing uh, in the Office of the Vice President for Diversity and uh, share a little bit of history about the position. When this position was created, it was created as a half-time position. And uh, when I was selected, it was half-time uh, vice President and half-time Associate Vice President for the Division of Enrollment and Access. Uh, those first three years, it was going to be three years of a half-time position, and I think everybody knows that half-time positions don't really exist, right? Mm -hmm. So you end up with two full-time positions, and it, it was, I think, fair to say that it was pretty brutal. Um, and people ask me during the interview process, how will you know whether you have been successful as a Vice President for Diversity? And I remember the response, because I looked back and I said, it's really not a question about whether I have been successful, it's whether we have been successful as an institution. Because clearly you cannot expect one half-time person to change everything on this campus, right? So one of the first things that needed to happen was to build an infrastructure. And an infrastructure that would allow for different people to be engaged in diversity at Colorado State University to have an understanding about diversity as we were talking about it, or certainly as, as I was thinking about it. And one of the first things, of course, was data. 
because I have been on campus, and I think many of you know this, you hear the story all the time. Um, this is my 50th year on campus. Five votes. <laughs> You don't need to be here anymore, any longer. Or something. And I said, I said, you know, you're right. You're right. <laughs> but I still love it, and I still enjoy it. But I realized, of course, that if you're at a university, people want data. We want numbers. I could share all of the ideas. I could share all of my experiences. I could share what I had come to know in all of that time. But without data, it probably was not going to work out very well. And so I started creating a, a variety of different committees and placing on those committees people across campus that were experts in those particular areas. And one of those committees was the assessment group for diversity issues. And we, um, we started with a climate, uh, a climate survey. And we have been doing that climate survey every two years, 2012, 2014, 16, and 2018. And the committee members, you know, have changed a little bit over time. And there was a uh, renewed emphasis this year, working with the deans to really try to get as much participation as possible. And this year, uh, our response rate was something like 58%. Wow. And we decided a couple of things right from day one. One, we will be transparent. Because how can people know where the problems are if they don't know where the problems are, right? So if you go to our diversity website, you will find those, those climate surveys and you will see, here are the issues at Colorado State. It's not a secret. And it's the same kind of issues that, that I knew existed. Now we had quantitative and qualitative information to, to back that up. Um, so transparency was, was very important. And we also knew that we had to be able to act on the information that we learned about, right? And so the uh, super required supervisory training is an example of that. It became very apparent that there were some issues there. So uh, the, the council, uh, I think it was a collaboration, we all got together and said, really, we need to push this. And so that, that became a part of it. We also know and we learned that, that different divisions, you can have the same, the same response or the same percentage of a response in different divisions and in one division, it would be hallelujah, and in another division, it would be, oh, what was me? What happened? Uh, we need to work on this. And that's because we all have different missions, and we have different cultures, and we have everything is different. So we relied upon the university to help us interpret the data that we were getting. And we should not be afraid of the data. I mean, it may not, it may not show everything in a positive light, but that's okay. How are we going to get better if we don't know where the problems are, right? So uh, the assessment group for diversity issues and the development of the climate survey was something that came out of our office. There was a committee that was put together called Recruitment and Retention of Diverse Employees. That committee was instrumental in making sure that all jobs uh, for admin pro and faculty have statements in there related to diversity. That if you apply for a job at Colorado State, you have to address diversity. <laughs> uh, and the, the goal was that not only did you have to do it when you applied, but then you would be able to be asked questions as part of the, as part of the uh, search process. That's not necessarily happening as part of the search process, we understand, but you do have to do it as part of the application process. This committee also was responsible for putting together, for, for developing the idea of the exit interview process. And yes, there is an exit interview process on this campus. And we identified something like 60 people who were interested in becoming exit interviewers. Uh, we selected 12, we trained 12, and then we handed everything over to OEO so that people who are leaving the university, they can tell us what are the issues on this campus and where what are the problem areas and what do we need to do? Uh, that committee had started to work on stay interviews. Why do people stay? It's important to know why people leave, but also why do people stay? And in particular, how about the people who are moving from one unit to another, to another, to another? What's causing all of that? 
So that's the kind of work that that group was working on. The consultation team for incidents of bias. Um, that, that group was created uh, the first year that, that I became a VP. And since then, we now have a bias assessment team. And some of you may not know this because of, we, have do not, we have not done an official launch, a hard launch. But there is a, a, a bias process. So if you're experiencing bias, you can submit an incident report. We're trying to figure out where are these situations occurring? And what are, are, are there any themes? Are there any, are, is there anything there that we really can, can identify and start to address? And you have all heard the, the different kinds of stories, the swastikas and you know, the N-word here and uh, different situations. Well, we want to know where those areas, where those situations are taking place. Um, and again, it, 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 it is centered on, on data. It's not just a, an anecdote. We, we now can get information about that. So we have a bias assessment team, and then we also have a bias executive action team. Now, these groups are getting together because nowadays things are moving very fast. We have to be very nimble. Um, there was a time when a, bi a bias incident would come to our attention, and we could um, call everybody and gather the next day for a meeting. Well, nowadays you don't have a whole day to gather for a meeting. You have to respond immediately. Or do we? And so those are the questions that we are asking ourselves, and how do we, how do we deal with that? Um, <clears throat> we also have the first generation university initiatives. We, we work with faculty and staff on how do they work with first generation students. And again, this is an example of, of how we're trying to address our broad definition of diversity. Uh, <clears throat> we were instrumental in creating the uh, inclusive, creating an inclusive physical and virtual campus policy. And so those of you who have noticed that we have all gender restrooms, this committee is the one that was responsible for that. There, we first looked at converting something like 265 bathrooms because the trans community folks came to us and they said, I, I didn't know this, but there were students who were making, scheduling their classes based on when they would need to use the restroom because they felt unsafe on this campus. And I thought, how, what is going on with that? And, and we learned that it was really educating people because I had somebody come to me and say, I'll be damned if I will work on a campus where they have all gender restrooms. And I said, so then in your house, you must have a restroom for your wife and a restroom for you. And he said, no, I don't. And I said, then you have an all-gender restroom. And he said, that's an all-gender restroom? And I said, that is an all-gender restroom. <laughs> and so really, it, it was trying to educate people. And what we found is that, that it wasn't just the trans community that benefited mm -hmm. from this. There were so many other groups and so many other populations but I give thanks to the trans community for bringing it to our attention. Um, and this committee that continues to meet on a very regular basis has developed standards that impact new buildings, renovations, uh, and we have introduced more lactation spaces, prayer and reflection spaces. We talk about appropriate signage and Braille to make sure that Braille is correct. It was brought to our attention that some of the Braille signs are incorrect. It's like, oh my gosh, um, that is an issue. Break rooms. And people say, well, what, is, what do break rooms have to do with diversity? Well, it has to do with class. Because you can have people who are told you cannot eat lunch at your desk unless you are in an office. But what if you don't have an office? Where do you go to lunch? And you have to park at some of the parking lots far away. What do you do? And you don't have the money to go to the student center every day in order to buy, buy lunch. So you have your, your, your meal, and you have to go find a place to have lunch. But if we had a break room, if everybody had break rooms, and break rooms are critical, they really are. And so that committee is working on all of those kinds of things. The gender equity work that, that is coming out of our office, I think, is just 
fabulous. Uh, you know, the Feminist Fight Club work, many, there are a number of people who are involved with Feminist Fight Club, the continuation of the women of color, uh, the men educate yourself, are examples of, of the kinds of activities that, that uh, related to gender equity. And, and it is, it's important. It is very, very important. The principles of community, that was an effort that came out of the Office of the Vice President for Diversity. It took about a year to develop that. And I often think about Shannon, because two years, Shannon says it was two years. Uh, and I think about Shannon because she wanted it done right away. And this is before she even worked in the office. And I thought, you're not the boss of me. <laughs> and, so, and she kept saying, it has to happen. You know, we need to have it right away. And I, I said, Shannon, to me, process is important. It's very important. We, we shared the principles of community with over 1,000 people before we took it to cabinet. And a and 1,000 people, every single word, we talked about every single word that was in that document. And it took time. But what is the quote you always use, Shannon? If you want to go slow? And so that's what the principles of community. And there were people who worked on that, and, and they were just great deans, students, AP, CP, staff members. Uh, it took a little while, but I think, I think it, the work was well worth it. Um, training, the kind of training that comes out of, this, out of the office. And many of the items I'm talking to you about are um, things we have been doing since the beginning. Uh, in one way or, or the other. The Social Justice Leadership Institute, we do that every summer, and some of you have participated in that, creating an inclusive campus, those workshops, the Faculty Institute for Inclusive Excellence. Um, and there have been a number of, of anecdotes related to that. One that I, I just have to share this one because I think it's great. Uh, we were, I was sitting at a, an AP Council meeting, uh, AP Council luncheon, and I'm sitting next to a young man, and we introduce ourselves, and uh, I tell him my name, and he says, oh, I've been involved with your programs. And I said, oh, that's great. What did you think? He said, I, was, I went to the Creating an Inclusive Campus, and he said, it was great. And then he just stopped, and he stares at his food, and I thought, what did I say? What's going on? And then he oh, I don't know, maybe a minute passes. And he turns to me and he said, it ruined me. And I said, excuse me? He said, it ruined me. He said, I never saw injustice, social injustice, until I, I went through that program. And now I see it everywhere. I see it in commercials. I see it in movies. I see it in the way my friends talk. I see it in the way my family talks. And I can't get away from it. It's everywhere. And I'm thinking, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and, and I'm also thinking, we need a, uh, an inclusive campus 201. Because, and I, I, was, I was hopeful that young man was going to get through this. But also, what do we do as an office <coughs> to help that student, that student, that young man, it was a staff member, get to that next phase? Because he had come to understand some things um, that he had never understood before. And then a, a few other quick things, quick things. Uh, the collaboration with colleges and divisions regarding diversity and inclusion, we're trying to work more and more with the colleges. Um, many of the colleges have identified individuals in their colleges to work on diversity. And so we call it a diversity and inclusion network. We've had several meetings where we're coming together to, to talk about how do we all work together so that we are um, sharing a similar message. We want everybody in the colleges and in all of those units to be successful. Uh, the President's Commission on Diversity and Inclusion has a number of committees that have been working on, on um, items. There's a pause right now as we determine what is the best strategy moving forward. But there was hiring committee recommendations because our OEO process, I think the process itself is okay, but there are some things that absolutely, absolutely need to be tweaked. And we've made recommendations for those. There's a group working on class issues, on uh, pronouns. So recommendations have been submitted, disaggregating data. 
uh, and that becomes important in trying to figure out who is on this campus. Translations and interpretations, faith, beliefs, and cultural inclusion, those are the kinds of committees that are working. Of course, the diversity symposium, yay, Raya. Uh, and they're just, those, to name a few, we have a lot of other things that are going on, but thank you, Joyce, for asking. <laughs> 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 it's a pretty impressive list, um, and I, I know that there's more, so, um, but it's, I, I think it has been phenomenal, and it is why CSU is known really throughout the country for being ahead of everyone else in terms of institutionalizing these kinds of processes. Um, so thank you for that, Mary. It's just... Um, been extraordinary, you and your team, and everything they've accomplished. Thank you. I do have a question related to social justice, and it reminded me as we were chatting about this young man and his, his ability now to see social justice everywhere. So um, <clears throat> we believe um, social justice is a practice, as well as a goal, of course. How do you embed principles of equity into your, into your leadership style? Well, I was really uh, just blown away that social justice was one of the thing items that was included in the principles of community. And I, I want to tell you why that meant so much to me. And one of them is a little bit funny, and one of them is very serious. So one of the things that everyone knew about Martin Luther King and the mar March on Washington was really that he was um, so instrumental in the civil rights movement and he was working so hard for racial equality, right, and an end to discrimination. The other thing that was really important about Martin Luther King in that moment in time was he was on a national platform raising issues of social justice that went to race but also to poverty, to economic injustice, and the kinds of equity issues that we now think of when we think of an expanded social justice mission. So, so for me, just historically, that was really important. Um, the thing that is funny, I think, it was funny to me at the time, my father is a social worker. So my father, my whole life, talked to us, to the children, about social justice. And I decided that I wanted to become a lawyer, not a social worker. And my dad said, and I, I wanted him to be proud of me, as we all want our parents to be proud of us. And he was really disappointed in me. And he said to me, oh, honey, don't you know, justice doesn't happen in the courtroom. That was a, because he really thought that social justice and equity happens when you're really out there in both being an activist but also incorporating it into everything that you're doing every time you try to make a decision. How are you incorporating those kinds of items about social justice? So when you talk about principles of equity in my leadership, one of the things, an example is, I've been really struck, I've met with all of the council's faculty council, um, Administrative Professionals Council and the Classified Staff Council. And one of the things that's really struck me is we ask everyone to be part of this amazing community. But with some of our groups, and particularly classified staff, we don't actually give them time in any official way to participate in the community through service, through leadership. Um, and that really struck me as something, just as you're talking about the break room as being an, a, a really important um, socioeconomic class difference, the idea that we have wonderful classified employees on this campus that are doing great work, um, that we would think that they can't participate in the kind of service that we ask people to do, um, I, just, I think that's inequitable, and I think that building into their plans the opportunity to do service, to have that service count, to matter in their evaluations, 
that's really meaningful to me in terms of an, a way of incorporating um, equity into everything we do. Um, and the, going back to the broad definition of diversity, I think that being able to embed those goals of social justice is also always being mindful of all of the ways in which we think of diversity so that we're not leaving anyone out and that that's part of social justice and leadership as well. So um, I, I really, I understand that in some circles, social justice is a very contested term now but I think it really is so fundamental to what we do on this campus that I am really proud that it's corp incorporated into the principles. Great. Great. So, and, and everyone knows this, I was going to ask Mary this question. I can also ask Blanche and any of you probably will comment on it in your questions, but we're facing a very different, rapidly changing national landscape now. And if we look back of where we've come in 2019 from 2008, when um, Barack Obama won the election, and we all were extremely hopeful about the national landscape around race and bias. And now here we are in that post period experiencing um, things on a national level and on campus that we had hoped um, and maybe we, I think Kimberly Crenshaw used the term delusional, um, that we were delusional, that we were going to come out the other side of it and things would be better. What do you think diversity offices like your, off, your office and, and maybe yours too, Blanche, and I can talk about ours, but what do you think we should be doing differently since what's going on is so different? I think for me, it's really important that we learn from all of these different situations. You know, we can, we can lament the fact that we're having to go through all of this, and there are days when it's pretty difficult, and I, and I know that people are challenged, and it's, and it's, it's hard, and, but we have to learn. We have to figure out what are the lessons in this particular situation. Um, and these, these situations, they're difficult, but, but there are lessons to be learned, and we have to incorporate those lessons in, as we move forward. Um, you know, when I'm, I'm thinking of the, the word diversity, and I think I shared with you the story of how we came to have the name diversity, but often people do think of diversity, and they think of just numbers, and yet at, here at Colorado State, it was never really just about numbers. I mean, even just with our definition, you can see we're talking about something more, more than that. Um, but we haven't been very good at, about communicating, and we, we just recently, recently, as in last night at 5 o'clock, hired um, officially a uh, director of communications for our office. And I think we have to do a better job, <laughs> yay, <laughs> yay, uh, a better job of communicating uh, to everybody. Now, how do we do that? because not everybody reads the same sources. Uh, you know, they don't go to the same sources for information. Students go one place, faculty go in another place. Um, staff are going someplace different. And, but communication is vital. It is so very, very important, especially now. And, you know, I, I'm thinking about um, our radical transparency days, which were just, you know, just behind us. When we, when we had made a decision as an institution, and some people aren't familiar with this, but right after the, the noose incident that occurred on campus, um, you may recall that Tony Frank met with, with um, students in the residence halls, and he, he talked to them about what had occurred and in that residence hall. And then he had a large meeting with, um, with many students in the North Ballroom, and students were not very happy with Tony. And they said, but we don't, you didn't meet with us. You didn't meet with me in my residence hall. You met with that residence hall, but you didn't meet with my residence hall. And there was an expectation that, that they wanted to hear directly from, from the administration or others about what was going on. 
He said, we don't want to hear it on social media. We don't want to hear it from our friends in that residence hall what happened. We want to hear it from you all. So there was a decision that was made, a very conscious decision, to share information with everybody. So that's when you started hearing information about the news incident, and Tony would send messages to, to everybody about situations that were occurring, right? And you may r remember the situation with the, the Native students, and there was a message that was sent out from Blanche and myself and Leslie, letting people know what had occurred. And that was our effort to be radically transparent about what was happening. And for a couple of reasons. One, we wanted to honor what the students were requesting, and that was to share with them information. And then also to let people know these things do happen. And so let's have conversations about this, imp this issue. Well, has that backfired insofar as students are now saying, I'm so tired of hearing all the things that happen at Colorado State University, right? Why, and, and I have heard from some of the students who had requested this, this particular protocol, and they say, were saying, I get calls from my friends at Boulder, and they say they don't have these things happening at Boulder, <laughs> and they don't have these things happening someplace else. Well, we all know that they do, but it's not being shared in the same way. So I think for us, we have to, we have to figure out how do we honor this, this commitment to transparency, and I think that's important. I think people need to know what's happening. But without putting the institution in a place where things go viral and everybody thinks that Colorado State University is a bad place to be, because it's not. It is not a bad place. But when you're reading all of this all the time, you start to wonder what's happening on our campus. So I think communication is something we're going to have to really really address. I think uh, assessment of all that we do, and uh, I know that people in our office hear this from me, we need to know what, what we are doing that is, that is um, effective and what is not. We don't, we don't have the resources to just keep putting money into activities if they're not going to be having an impact. So we, we have to be careful about that. I think we also have to really focus on race. Race, 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 race. And um, it's not that we have not attempted to do that, but there has in the past been pushback on that. And I think we are now at a time where we have to just deal with that pushback as opposed to say, okay, let's figure this out. Let's go, you know, let's come at it a different way. I think we have to be pretty, pretty direct and just do it. And I am, I'm very um, encouraged because we had listening sessions after the, the uh, blackface in incident, and people were saying, we want to know more about race. And this, these kinds of uh, responses are coming from, from white faculty and staff, saying, we want to know what we are doing to contribute to this, perhaps inadvertently. And so we want to have discussions about whiteness. And I know we have tried, we tried to, to go there last year, and there was pushback. But I think we need to, we're going to have to move in that direction. Um, and as uh, President McConnell mentioned, we did have a conversation with the University of Washington. And um, some of the things that they are doing there, we found to be really pretty exciting. Um, and it's not to say that we would abandon all that we are doing here, not at all. It's simply to say that we take what we have done, you use the principles of community perhaps as a, a foundation, the work that, that is going on in the colleges and the units uh, and in different offices, and then you build from that. And they have an inclusion, um, a diversity and inclusion committee on their board of regents. Why don't we have one on our board of governors? Right? And, and their Board of Regents committee is apparently quite active in holding others accountable, others such as other leaders within the university accountable for diversity and inclusion. And I think, I thought that was a great idea. Uh, more engagement with deans as leaders. Uh, I think the leadership 
is really so very, very important on this campus. And again, I'm, I've mentioned the diversity and equity network, working with people across the campus who are working on diversity issues to ensure that we're all moving uh, in a similar direction. If you make mistakes when trying to do work on diversity and inclusion, it could take years to correct those mistakes. And we don't have time to do that. I, I agree completely that there is a sense of urgency and we have to keep going forward. So. I uh, agree with all of that. And, um, but I think for me, um, I think we're at a special time in history where we can move forward and do some amazing things and do what we need to do to, to change this world for where it needs to be. And I recall, I reflect back on the ASCSU meeting, uh, those six hours of students, one after the other, and the community members too, but I was more concerned around the students. And, um, and many of them black students. So this was not only a professional experience, for me it was a personal one. And here, and I've been, not as long as Mary, she, I love to be with her because then I'm not the <laughs> oldest. But <laughs> I've been here for 35 years. And when I first hear students, you know, sharing their pain of their experience here, and, and I'm thinking about all the things that I know we have done, and particularly when students say, CSU does not care about me. CSU brought me here and my experience has been good. <coughs> my first reaction was, what do you mean? We do want you here and we've done this and this and this and this and all the things that Mary said, plus all the things that I've known we've done in the Division of Student Affairs and Enrollment and Access and Academic Affairs. I know that we care about students and this is a passion for us. But I had to get past that and say, and even all the things we're doing, it's not enough. And we're not quite hitting the mark, right? Because these students are sharing experiences that I had 40 years ago when I was in college. Same kinds of stuff, right? And I'm like, this is not OK. What's, what's happening here? So I got past that, uh, why are they, we are doing this stuff to the pain. And then I felt really sad that it hurt to see that these are students that I care so deeply about, and they're in pain. And am I part of that? Have I not done enough? What have I missed, right? So then I stepped, felt like crying, and I thought, then it's about me and not about them, so stop that. <laughs> but then, this is the part that excites me. When I went to college, I went to a predominantly white university, a small college in the 70s. I knew when I went, chose to go to a predominantly white school that they did not want me. They didn't think I belonged. They were only letting us in because if they wanted federal money, they had to. The professors that weren't going to change the way they taught, my history was not going to be included in the curriculum. There would be allies there, and there were. There were wonderful some faculty and staff and folks that helped make it through, but I knew that I was not welcome, that if I got through this, it would be because those of us of color were going to have to support each other, rely on our allies, and say to them, I came here, and I'm going to work my butt off, and you're not going to make me leave, and I don't care if you don't think I belong here. You're going to have to deal with me. That's the attitude we had to have. But the difference now, as you talk about what is the difference, is that we have invited our students to come to this university. We have said, we believe in diversity. We want your voices. We want you to bring your experiences and your histories, all of you. And we've got to figure out how it's going to work. But you are part of our university, and we have to change. We have to transform to include you so that our learning will be better for everybody. Our white students need to know how to deal with diversity because that's the new world. We, we have to do that. And so, if that's the case, I was so excited that they, gave, they went up to that microphone and said, CSU, you've got to do better. 
this is not okay. You invited us here. So you are going to include us. If you want to keep us here, you have to. That's amazing. I, went to, I was so proud, so proud that we have gotten to that point. I believe as a university, we are at a place where we can meet that challenge. I think we're already trying to do that, but it's gonna look different. And higher education has to look different. And the schools who understand that and understand how we have systematically have to change the way we view what higher education looks like, what it needs to be, who needs to be included, the schools that do that are going to be the ones who are going to be successful in the future. I believe as hard as these last couple of months, I ain't gonna lie, it's been a, it's been a tough month. <laughs> and I believe that we will be better for it. Yeah. Our students deserve it. Our faculty and staff deserve it. Our state needs it. Our country needs it and the world needs it. And I want us, all of us, and it's gonna take all of us, to be able to lead that. And it's gonna look different. Okay. And I think that's the big difference, is it's going to look different. And some of it, we don't even know what that's gonna look like, because we haven't had it before. But we just know we need to figure out a way to make it work. Blanche said it all. Yeah. <laughs> She's um, so absolutely right about what we need to do, and, and it's an amazing moment in time. It's the time that we can pivot. It's the time that we can really attend to race and ask the important questions about how do we address the kind of racism that people are experiencing, whether they're experiencing it here or in the community or in the, in the world and also allows us to open our minds to the other kinds of bias that we see. So for example, when Charlie Kirk came the last time, um, we had white supremacists on our campus. Part of their agenda is based on race. Part of their agenda is also based on seeing Jewish religion as a race and they do not believe the Holocaust happened. So that kind of education that Blanche is talking about around we cannot be a historical, we have to make sure that we are speaking the truth to our students about what the kinds of things they say and do actually mean in a historical context. Yeah. It is really extraordinary um, for us to have that moment. It was a gift that our students gave us, mm -hmm. that they were willing to go one by one, 700 strong, to a microphone in a public yeah. setting and talk about their experiences. Mm -hmm. They gave us the gift of understanding much better the seriousness of what's going on the constancy of what's going on, the environments in which they experience it, and all of that helps us. And I, when I say us, I mean the entire campus, not just the people who are sitting up here in front of you. But it helps us understand our responsibility for targeting remedies and actions that will make a difference. And so figuring out what those things are are what people are helping us do right now. All of the different conversations we've been having. And one of the things that students have said loud and clear, and I deeply appreciate, is they have said, look, this is on you. You, the leadership at this university, have to do something about this. And it can't be on the backs of the students. Because what I've heard, what we've heard loud and clear, is students are really tired of carrying what they believe is a burden that they alone have carried. And so we take responsibility for moving forward and for figuring out how we're going to confront racism and other forms of bias on this campus 
and we're going to do it as quickly as we possibly can. One of the things that has been really, really important for me to learn is there are actually some things that have been in the pipeline already, and they're just about to launch. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that a lot of students have raised with us, well, we need to be doing more education with our students as they come in around racism and bias and what it means and how it hurts and how it damages not only individuals but the community. And that was something that Mary and Blanche had already started working on with other people. And so we really are going to be able to move this much more quickly than we could otherwise because people have been moving these things forward over time. There's also, we, we understand that there are also some modules now that are gonna be available for our professors to be able to engage in those modules and learn how what they're doing pedagogically in the classroom or in terms of facil facilitation in the classroom, how that may or may not be helping or hurting the ability to have these honest conversations in the classroom. And then of course we have more work to do in the residence halls and figuring out how we're gonna launch these conversations in the residence halls. But what I'm really, really encouraged by is as difficult as the national conversation is right now, I think, I agree with Blanche, we can be better and we can be leading in this space. But we can't back off of focusing on racism and bias and seeing its fundamental roots, mm -hmm. how we attack it, and how we turn that around so that this is the kind of place that everyone feels and can actually thrive. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're going. Yeah. Good. So um, I think, Mary, you're supposed to ask me the next question. <laughs> I feel like we're on the view. <laughs> No, I think you're supposed to ask me. <laughs> oh, I'm supposed to ask you, okay. Um, choice to marry, yes. I, well, we've talked about this a lot, but, um, and I think we've covered it. Have yeah. you? Right, well, except, uh, kind of, except the organization around. Organization. Oh, right. okay, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Um, you know, Joyce has been here for just a, a few months and is learning about the campus, and one of the things that, that uh, she came to learn about how we had made a decision about approaching race and um, I mean, uh, diversity and inclusion on campus. We are very privileged at Colorado State to have such a strong division of student affairs led by blind shoes. And <laughs> <laughs> and, and because of that, when this position was created, we decided, okay, why take all of those things and break those up to put them into a new position? Let's leave them in student affairs, mm -hmm. and then our focus would be on faculty and staff. And so that's the model that we have been using, recognizing that there sometimes is overlap. Yeah. And so our, our units meet on a regular basis, mm -hmm. and Blanche and I chat on a regular basis. That's why she doesn't have a problem telling me that I'm old. Um, <laughs> and so we, we are able to, to figure out, okay, in situations where there's a question about, is this something that her division should work on, or is this something that our division should work on, we then come to some agreement about how to approach it. So just to let you know that that's generally how we, how we are working. Now, does that have to change, or should it change? I think over time, we'll continue to assess. I, you know, we'll figure, yeah. figure this out as we're right. going forward. But to date, I think it has worked out it has worked out well. It, it, yeah, and I think one of the reasons is it helps to have a lead. And so we know with the students, with our uh, cultural centers and resource centers, that have always, I mean, for a long time, that was diversity on, on this campus in terms of supporting students. And those, those units do amazing work. And, okay, I do have to say I used to be the director of the Black African American Cultural Center, so I, you know, I gotta be transparent here. <laughs> But, but, I, but we know that, that they serve a very important purpose, a place on this campus, but, that, but that's not the only place. That even within the Division of Student Affairs, 
uh, there are a lot of areas that this is a core value of ours, and we work with students around that in everything that we do. Um, but we, and it's about retention and those things, so that's why we take the lead in, in things that are clearly more student, but with the support of uh, the VP for Diversity Office. For faculty and staff issues, they take the lead, and then we're there to support. And I have to tell you, in a time when we didn't have this office, we had to do all of it. And it was very awkward, because that's a lot to try to work with faculty and staff and issues there and students. And so I think it's very critical in a lot of the training and different things that happen in VP for Diversity, many, many staff within the Division of Student Affairs help with those trainings as well. Yeah. So there's a lot of cross things so that we are supporting each other. And yeah, sometimes, and most of the times, it involves both, mm -hmm. right? But it's just how do we manage that? And I think that's confusing a lot for some people who don't quite always understand how we're working together. We figure it out, and, uh, and we'll continue to assess that as we move forward. And we know other units, like Enrollment and Access, also does a lot in academic affairs and our student success initiatives. All of that is part of uh, working on these things together. Mm -hmm. That's also exciting, that it's not just us and it's not just your office, but more of the whole university is, is embracing the fact that these are things we all need to be involved in and how do we help each other to learn how to do this better and support each other. Yeah, we have had colleagues from across different, you know, from different institutions across the country marvel at the fact that we can do this. Um, and, and not just our offices, but you mentioned enrollment and access and academic side and such. And it, it really is important that we work together. And I think it's an example of how we are, we do believe that we're all in this together mm -hmm. and, and trying to, to advance uh, similar goals. Yeah. So as we have talked a little bit about um, the race bias and equity initiative that you introduced, I don't know if you want to say a little more about that since. Sure. So the, the race bias equity initiative is what I announced at the fall address, but I also announced that we were going to be engaged as a campus in courageous strategic transformation. And the reason I want to mention both of those at once is because I didn't want people to think that somehow those are separate, right? Part of the courageous strategic transformation is focusing on race and bias and equity and figuring out what it is we can do that is concrete that will make a difference. So there are some things that I think we can do that are concrete that have to do with the way in which certain things are embedded, right? So one of the divisions I know embedded the principles of, um, the principles of community in all of their employee evaluations. Are people actually mm -hmm. walking the walk, right, and talking the talk? Are they doing it? That's something that's very concrete, but it's been done in one place. Mm -hmm. If we're going to really, really make sure that we're embedding all of these processes, it has to be across the campus. It has to be everywhere. Mm -hmm. So that, that idea of how do we take these structural issues that we know we have and change it. So for example, educating around race and bias, right, and what it is that it means and how it harms individuals and harms our community, those are things that we have to be able to talk about. And one of the difficult things always on a university's campus is every year we're incorporating five to 6,000 new people into our community. So being able to deliver that education, that message, the knowledge of the principles of community and the significance of them and who we are has to be done almost before students arrive on campus, right? And then it has to be reinforced once they're here. So the question with the, with the race bias equity initiative, if we know that would make a difference, how are we going to embed it? And how are we going to drive it? How are we going to scale it up? And how are we going to make sure it's working? That assessment piece that Mary talked about. Because what we don't want to do is do something for three years and find out it's actually not effective. 
right? And we have expertise. This is one of the most wonderful things about this campus. We have incredible expertise to help us figure out how we can target these across the board fundamental systemic changes and then how we can measure whether they're working. And many, many faculty, many experts, many researchers have stepped forward to say, hey, this is in my line of work. I can be helpful. And I am so thankful, and I believe that if we all pull together, we're actually going to be able to, to take the race bias equity initiative and use it as our tool for embedding these changes that will help us attack systemic racism and bias. So I'm really, really optimistic about that, and I want to thank for any faculty who are here who have stepped up, experts, researchers, students, I want to thank you all for that because it's already giving us great momentum. Thank you. How, how do we, Joyce, as an institution, uh, balance upholding everybody's favorite subject, um, individual First Amendment rights of our community members, knowing the harm that these rights can, can cause to other members of our community? Yeah, well, I think that this is one of the things that Kimberly Crenshaw addressed so well at her address, and I don't know how many people were able to come, but one of the things she talked about was shifting baselines, that what may have worked at one time doesn't work at another. <coughs> Excuse me, and she talked about the First Amendment as being one of those things that's embedded in our Constitution that may actually not be able to to address these shifting baselines. And, and so then we have to think about, well, how do we balance these things? And what can we do if that's true? If we are bound to the First Amendment in certain ways, prohibiting us from do certain things, what do we do instead, right? So an example of that is students were um, rightfully really upset about well, these kind of racist, biased expressions are violations of our principles of community, right? Why can't we do something about it? And then you have the counter of the First Amendment saying whether it's expression or speech. So the question I asked is how can we embed those principles community more dramatically and enforceably in our student conduct code? And so I asked the general counsel, please look at that, see what we can do. Maybe we can't do it all, but maybe there's some things we can do, right? It's not enough for us to just say, well, it's the First Amendment. The other thing that I, I wanted to talk about with the First Amendment, and Mary and Blanche and I were talking about this um, before we came on stage, is, and, and Kimberly Crenshaw mentioned this as well, that during the 60s and 70s, the, the public campuses were keeping people off campus, like Angela Davis and the Black Panthers, and it was only the First Amendment that made the difference that they were held accountable and they were able to have those voices on campus. In this situation, in the uh, student protest, one of the people who was protesting was carrying the public enemy uh, symbol. And I got a lot of requests, um, both locally and nationally, or, or statements telling me that student should be punished for that speech. And I was able to say, well, absolutely not, because that's speech right, and it's protected. So being able to balance how the First Amendment works is something that really is a challenge on public campuses, but it's something that now we're talking about and we're really, really working hard to see what it is we can do differently that we're not doing and where it is that it actually can benefit the work that we're trying to do. So I wanted to share that with this group. One, because it's important. I think, Mary, you've asked a really, really important question. But I know that a lot of people have been really angry about it. And so we wanted to just be absolutely transparent in how we addressed it. Great. Thank you. No, 
I agree. I I, you know, I, I think it's really hard because, again, understanding history, right? For so many years, I mean, centuries in this country, some of us didn't have, we weren't allowed our First Amendment rights. So when I hear students or other people now say, oh, the, it's, it's horrible, I'm like, no, no, no. No, no, I, I want the First Amendment right now. If we need, because our world has changed, if we need to go into the Constitution and tweak that First Amendment, then maybe that's what somebody, some of the students who become great attorneys and lawyers can go do that, right? So we could do that, but at the, we need to understand that it's both ways. And, um, and that how then can we use that, not as an excuse, because just because we can't punish somebody doesn't mean we can't educate them. So how do we figure out ways in which we can educate? Uh, because isn't that what we're about, right? Yeah. That we meet people where they are, and then we build them up. That's all of us. That's our role at an educational institution. And I do think sometimes people, people forget that. And yeah. But sometimes we need our policies to reflect and our that policies we, have to reflect we are that. allowed to do that. Yes, we not, have so. to be allowed to yeah. do that. Absolutely. Yeah. I was becoming yes, mindful with time. of the time, and I know you want to leave 20 minutes at least for Q&A. Do you want to go ahead and take questions? We're the ones that you have? We, yeah, we, so we do have some questions that were submitted, and we thought we'd try to get some that weren't covered in our regular conversation. Um, so this was one that someone submitted. Um, how do you envision the future leaders of CSU and the city of Fort Collins? How will they be able to rely on the CSU administration for support and guidance? Well, I, that's such a great question that someone submitted. We've already started work with Fort Collins. One of the things we heard loud and clear from students is as much as they were experiencing incidents of bias on campus, they were experiencing incidents of bias in the community. We, so we, we need to really work on this, not just on campus, but with our community. So we reached out to the mayor and to the um, city, manager. city manager, a city planner, and we also have members of the city council who are CSU employees, and then we have other employees who are serving as liaison around these bias issues. We also want to bring in the philanthropic community. We want to bring as many people in as we can to saying, what is it that we need to do differently in the larger community that are going to make all of us feel welcome? And just to make this very concrete, I thought it would be helpful to say that I know that um, our students of color have experienced racism in the community. I know there are women who have experienced sexism in the community. I know some of our Jewish students have been really, um, really disrespected in the community. Um, and I know that um, in particular, we have Middle Eastern Muslim women wearing hijabs who are afraid to go to the grocery store alone, so they text one another to go together. And that's just unacceptable. And so by pulling the mayor and all of these other assets in together and beginning to talk about it and how we can attack it as a community, I think is really, really important. I also think that this is an opportunity both at the community level on campus um, with all of our faculty, employees, and students. It's a great opportunity for us to be developing <coughs> new leaders who we know can have the kind of tools that are needed, not just now, but in the future, to be making a difference. I, th I think you know the question doesn't um, it doesn't speak to the school district, uh, but that is also another area that we That's have heard point. we have heard uh, people talk about that. And I know the school district is trying to address this. They have formed a committee that's called the EDAC committee, Equity, Diversity, Action Committee, something. And there are uh, representatives from the university who are on that, as well as representatives from the city, trying to, trying to address these very same mm -hmm. issues. Uh, but we have had situations where faculty members, because retaining faculty members of color in particular is really so difficult. And, and we have had faculty members who say, I love my department. I think everything is great. But at our school, my son or daughter experienced mm -hmm. 
and then they explain what their son or daughter experienced, and they say, we think that this is not a community for us. So they leave, mm -hmm. so they leave the university. And um, those stories have been shared with the school district, mm -hmm. and um, they, they are concerned about some of that, so we, we, need to, we need to work together. There's also a community equity coalition, a group that has been meeting now for a couple of years, and it includes um, people from the community, Jewish community, um, GLBT community, religious community, um, and others, and we, we have conversations about addressing some of these issues related to what's happening with the city. And I think the city is, is really concerned and interested in doing more. I, I don't have any question about that at all, uh, or any doubt. They, it, it has to do with funding, some, some is funding, and budget process and those kinds of things. And I have heard recently that they, they want to renew discussions, and so this is the time to do it. I think mm -hmm. it's important to get all of those players mm -hmm. um, together to have these conversations. Mm -hmm. That's great. Another population, and this was another question that came up as we talk about others, um, how have our alums, uh, our alumni, and particularly our alums of color, been included in the fold of advancing the university, mm -hmm. and what ways in which maybe we can include them more? One of the things that was so impressive about the night that the students spoke at the ASCSU meeting is that a lot of our stakeholders, some of whom were alums, but some of whom were not, actually traveled up from Denver um, to support mm -hmm. us and to support the students. And that was an ex extremely important showing of support. So since then, we've been reaching back out to alums, engaging them in conversations, not only about what their experiences were like when they were here, but also asking them, um, what is it that we can be doing differently mm -hmm. that you think will be making a difference, and engaging them on campus so that they can actually make a difference. And we have had the most outstanding um, response from our alums. It has been truly extraordinary. And some of them are, are so engaged in these issues in their professions that what we're actually seeing is we're, we're being able to mobilize a lot more professional help than we would have if we only turned inward. Um, and so I've been deeply appreciative of all of them. I do think that we have a lot more work to do in reaching out to our alumni of color because they may have had experiences in the past that so marginalize them that they don't want to engage and we have to reach out to them and tell them, no, times are different. We're really working on this, and we really need your help in making a difference. So the, the, we have the, the alums who are coming to us, and we're holding them close. But we've got to go out and do a lot more relationship building with our alums who we may not have touched. And right. I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I had an experience with, um, with an alum in Denver, uh, a, a black alum, graduated in the 70s, I believe. And she's lived in Denver her, her entire life. And she, once she graduated and she drove off this campus, she swore she would never come back again. Mm -hmm. And she never has. And she's a leader and has been a leader, has had an amazing career. And she was invited to a dinner by another alum who was one of her classmates, who we've gotten to get more involved in CSU. And we asked them, can you get, bring some of your friends to dinner with us? So he got her to come. And she had an attitude. I mean, she said, I'm here for a free meal. And I am not interested in, because, you know, I haven't been, I had a horrible experience. If it wasn't for my classmates, I couldn't have gotten through there. This is not a place that I care about. Um, and then we started talking about students. And, um, and that's what got her. And that's how I was able actually to get some alums to come back to CSU, black alums who, who were not crazy about this place. But I said, you, th the students needed you. How would your experience have been different had there been alums who came to talk with you and give you, let you know you could graduate from here and what strategies that you have. And we started talking about that and we got her to say, okay, 
I might come back. She didn't say she would, but she's willing to have that conversation for the students. It's not for CSU, but for the students. And we're like, whatever, we'll get you back, we'll get you back. <laughs> but, I, but it takes more of an effort than it does for those who've had great experiences here. Uh, but they're more connected. And I've also found that some of them who've gotten older, like but when they get into their 50s, I think that's when you start to reflect. You know, you're like, ooh, 50 more years. How, what was important to me? And many of them have said to me when they think about their college years, they were really important time. It was an important time for them. For many of them, that's where they met their spouse, they, their partners, their um, um, great memories that they'd forgotten. And so they really want to come back, and they're really interested to see what CSU is doing now, yeah. and then how can they come now and contribute. And I think we have to put special efforts around bringing those folks back, because I think they can really help us. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think many of you know that uh, where the, our office, the Office of the VP for Diversity is located in uh, the White House at the intersection of Laurel and Shields, and that used to be the President's House. And there were four presidents who lived there, and one of those presidents was President Chamberlain, I mean President Morgan, and, and Chamberlain, but Morgan. And um, he, was, he was president during the late 60s when students were protesting and asking for more students of color, et cetera. So a lot of demonstrations were held on that lawn. And so there are some mm -hmm. alumni who have come back, and they like having pictures taken uh, with the, the house and the sign that says diversity on the same lawn where they used to protest. So it's kind of a nice selfie for them. It is. <laughs> well, one of the things that um, is really true if, is if you look back at those experiences in the 60s and 70s um, and how, how many things have happened because of that disruptive period. So. Uh, for example, ethnic studies mm -hmm. really developed out of that period mm -hmm. of time and has become so critical on this campus and so many campuses in terms of the education that people can actually get. Um, and I just think that that's very powerful that they would want to come back and, and take their photographs in, in front of that sign. The, one of the questions that we were asked was, the, or a comment, the comment is CSU has been taking small steps for a long time, which fits into this. How can an institution like this take big leaps and take them quickly in improving our campus? And I think it's, it, it is such a fundamentally important question, but I think the first answer is that we've got momentum right now. Mm -hmm. And we cannot let the bad incidents that create momentum then allow us to back off and not keep that momentum going. I think that there's, there's a natural tendency to respond to an event, accomplish some things, think that it's all okay, or at least we made a difference, and then the next event happens and there's another peak. And I think what we really have to be mindful about is not the peaks and valleys, we have to really dig in deep. We have to say we're going to do this in a fundamental way and, and have a plan and then keep checking off as we accomplish those things in the plan. But, and this is the important but, that's not the end. We can't ever say it's done. It will never be done. And so we have to just keep remembering that we have to always be in this cycle of re-examination. Re and always saying, what is the next step that will make us better? And I think, you know, I think about higher education. We're just such turtles, you know? It just takes forever <laughs> to get things done. Um, you know, if something happens, if a proposal is, is, is put together in the fall, if by the end of the spring semester it has gone through faculty council, for example, that's a hallelujah that it didn't mm -hmm. wait for a whole extra year. And I think we need to, we need to adjust to, uh, and we need to be more nimble in higher yeah, education. absolutely. Because uh, our inability to do so, I think, can cause real damage. And so we're gonna have to figure out how to, mm -hmm. how to change things. 
I agree. So our time is about up. And I wanted to give you, Joyce, an opportunity. Is, is there anything that we didn't talk about or that you were asked that you really want to make sure you share with everyone? Well, I, uh, the first thing I want to share is that I'm absolutely passionate about seizing this moment and driving us, us all driving us forward to make this place better. I believe that if we take collective action with the power and support from the top, which is one of the things I wanted to say about the University of Washington, the fact that they have their board of regents on board, I've already had that conversation with Tony Frank, the chancellor, and he's already having those conversations with our board of governors. So we, there, there are steps that we can take that that can have significant impact. And I truly believe that the strength is when you can have the leadership from the top and all of the collective energy and wisdom and activism from the bottom, and you get those two together, and then we can make this change solid and lasting and change that will make a difference. And so I, I am committed to that. I know all of you are committed to that. I know the leadership of the university is committed to it. And so I say, let's go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. And uh, we appreciate having the opportunity to get to talk with you today. So thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.